Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is an Ilford Sprite 35 Mark II and unusually for this channel it is a new camera. You don't have to go scouting around through eBay listings or uh, charity or thrift stores to find all these. You can just buy it new off the shelf from your preferred quality retailer. Uh, let's go ahead and take it out of the box. I've obviously used this already but I just wanted to show you how it came packaged. Just before we take it out of the box, there's a couple of things written on the box that uh, I think are worth noting. It says it's a 31mm f9, and always a mark of quality is the phrase optical lens. It's focus free, uh, because we don't want, you know, focus. Uh, it has a built-in flash in it. There is a wrist strap, which is a bit of string enclosed, uh, and it encourages to shoot film which of course here at mostly vintage cameras we fully support uh, and it says 35 millimeter reusable film camera and then another call to arms to shoot film so as i say let's go ahead and take that out of the box and see what we actually have and boom there it is as you can see it's a very lightweight uh, all plastic construction, certainly appears to be all plastic construction. And what I'd like to do in this video is investigate this name a little bit because that's quite an interesting name, Sprite 35 Mark II. That suggests, of course, that there was at some point a Mark I. So uh, we need to look at that as fans of vintage equipment. I'll touch briefly upon the, the technical attributes of the camera although there are already a lot of very good videos on YouTube that go into those details uh, perfectly well so I won't spend too much time looking at that. What we will consider in some length or at some length is how it compares to a single use camera. These camera, this camera and cameras of its ilk, there are plenty of them, they're often sold as an alternative to disposable camera, they're sometimes called a reusable disposable or a reloadable single use camera uh, and so they make certain claims or at least certain claims are implied for these cameras you can reload with film versus a disposable camera and I think we should uh, take a look at those claims uh, and then we'll look at a little some photographs I took from a what was effectively a, a photo walk a tourist photo walk uh, in London one day but in the first instance let's uh, see where where it gets its name from so this as we said is available today brand new but in 1962 you could have this guy and this is the genesis of the sprint range of cameras the Ilford sprint cheap plastic construction simple plastic lens uh, one shutter speed um, two apertures it's got an aperture for color and an aperture for black and white so um, that's interesting color is the brighter image that was 1962 it runs on 127 film uh, so the negatives are about four times the size as they would be from a 35 mil film um, but nonetheless 127 film is a roll film with a backing paper it is or can be a little fiddly for some people to load and so just a couple of years after the sprite came the sprite 35 and of course this is the Mark I version of the camera we're looking at today. And I think this is uh, absolutely charming. I love the uh, 1960s style text on the front here. I love this um, kind of rope pattern finish on it. It is absolutely of its age. Now again, comparing this to the Mark II version, it's bigger, it's a little heavier. Uh, arguably uh, it's a little more solid, it feels a little bit more sturdy, the, essentially the plastic's a bit thicker. And it has an f8 lens. Uh, not just an f8 lens, but apparently one can change it, there it goes, it'll leave on the side. From f8, f11 and f16. What we don't have on the original is a built-in flash unit. Although there are contacts to take a flash bulb reflector, so it would slide in there and sit on the top. I've not been able to find one of those. But that is the original Ilford Sprint 35, if you were curious. And then we waited till the 21st century for the Mark II version. 
Now, in terms of the, the technicalities of the camera, if you will, uh, as you probably saw on the on the box, it's an f9 lens, so not very bright, not very bright at all. In fact, uh, it also has a single shutter speed, so the shutter speed is is said to be 125th of a second. 120th is actually what it says in the instructions. I'm going to call it 125th for reasons of convention. On the base, there's a battery cover. It takes a single treble A alkaline cell, which uh, goes in that way. There's a little diagram. Made a bit of a bit of a mess of doing that. Also on the base plate is the rewind button and then on the top plate we have the rewind crank and the shutter button. Uh, film loading is pretty simple. There's a little camera back release lever there. Push the crank out of the way. Now on the take-up spool, if you're used to other 35mm cameras, you might be looking for a slot to put the leader into. But there isn't actually one on this camera. So you just plonk the film in there, lay it over the take-up, and with any luck, we can see that the uh, sprockets are engaging up here and it's taken up there you can close the back and if you want a sort of a, a double check if you just take up the tension in the rewind crank then when you take pictures you'll see that it turns around as a rule now to rewind the film we press and I find it's a good idea on this camera to hold, press and hold the rewind release button and then turn in the direction of the arrow. And there we go. That is a little bit stiff, that rewind crank to pull up, but there we go, it's kind of functional. And that is pretty much how to use the camera. There's not really a lot to it. Now I bought this camera uh, because I was in a, in a camera shop and talking to a, you know one of the salesmen there, a very nice chap called Greg, and uh, I said to him, do, do you still sell any new film cameras? And he said no. And then he paused and said, actually, we do sell this one, and obviously pointed me towards this guy. Now obviously I was familiar with this genre of camera, these reusable disposables. There's the Ilford one, there's a Kodak and an Agfa branded version that are exactly the same camera, plus uh, a number of variations on a theme from other manufacturers. So naturally my first reaction was, 40 quid? 40 quid for that? Uh, followed by, it doesn't even come with a film at that price. Blimey. Greg did say that uh, they uh, had a certain niche following and they were quite fun to use and I've always been a little bit wary of this type of camera because of that uh, very poor maximum aperture. So um, I wasn't wildly impressed by the idea of it being fun to use. But then he said something that did pique my curiosity. He said this was a, a pro dealer, I should point out. It was a you know, proper high-end camera shop. Um, he said, we have a customer that shoots catwalk fashion shows. And she chooses to use one of these because the photographs she gets from it are so unique and so different. And that, of course, did pique my curiosity because, well, we like things that are creative and useful and different. So um, I put my hand in my pocket and I bought one. Now, comparing this to a disposable camera, uh, the argument is it's cheaper because you don't have to keep buying a new camera, just put, put a new film in. Uh, it's better for the environment because you're not putting so much material into the waste uh, management system. And I would also like to compare it to a disposable camera in terms of ease of use. So in terms of being cheaper, I'm assuming if you're worried about economy, you're going to buy the, the best or keenest price product you can find. So this camera is £40. Uh, a roll of film uh, is, let's say, £7. 
So four rolls of film plus the camera are £68. Four disposable cameras uh, at £17 each, which I have seen disposable cameras being sold for, uh, would also be £68. So this will be more economic, providing you shoot more than five rolls of film in it. Now my personal feeling is, if you're buying disposable cameras, and you're going to shoot more than four disposable cameras before buying what you might think of as a proper camera, or as we would say, an MVC, a vintage camera. If you're going to buy four disposable cameras, it's probably because you like the photographs you're getting. It'll probably be for a creative or aesthetic reason, rather than because you couldn't figure out how to buy an old film camera. On that basis, if you're using that many disposable cameras, you're probably going to carry on using them. But for the sake of argument, if you have been buying disposable cameras because you find them easy to use or convenient or whatever the reason may be, other than the creativity or the particular cosmetic look it gives you, then this could be a better bet. Now the second argument is this is better for the environment because you're only buying the film, uh, you're not replacing the entire camera. And that does hold water, of course. The thing with disposable cameras, though, is quite a lot of the camera is actually reusable by the manufacturer. Now, the infrastructure to return them to the manufacturer has been dented in the last 20 or 30 years, of course, uh, as film photography has given way to digital. But nonetheless, it is still possible to recycle big chunks of reusable cameras. So the environmental case, yes, this certainly would be more environmentally friendly, but the disposable camera might not be the complete landfill disaster zone that you thought it was. So it's a close run thing on both economy and on the environment, although I would say the Ilford Sprite Mark II does win out on both cases. Subject to a proviso will come to shortly. Now in terms of ease of use, this is pretty easy to load a film into and it's pretty easy to rewind the film at the end of it and of course we just we just got one button to take the picture one clicky switch to wind on and one button to turn the flash unit on that's all very standard and uh, the shutter button the wind on and the flash are the same as with the disposable camera of course however with a disposable camera, when you buy the camera, the film is already loaded in it. You don't need to load your own film. And at the end of your roll of film, it's already rewound. You don't rewind it. So the two things that cause most people to lose photographs, which is the loading and rewinding of the film, are taken care of in a disposable camera by design. You don't have to do it at all. So on ease of use, a disposable, I'd have to argue, is slightly easier to use. There we go. Now, on the environment and cost front, uh, I've used this camera once. I've put one roll of film through it. Uh, I did enjoy using it. It was fun to use. And the photographs were surprisingly good, uh, I have to confess. I had no problems with the camera. It worked fine. But reading consumer reviews of these cameras and other cameras like it, the Kodak Agra and so forth, and also one or two YouTube reviews that I've seen of this camera. There is a small but significant number of people that have experienced uh, malfunctions with the camera. Now it's hard to say if it's the fault of the manufacturer or the fault of the user. Certainly some of these bits and bobs are not the strongest, uh, particularly this rewind crank i could well imagine somebody not pressing in the rewind release button or not holding it in and it popping out and then as you're winding your film back if you're a little heavy-handed and the crank got jammed it would be possible to snap the rewind crank or to damage the film transport cogs and so forth um, that's not necessarily a failing of the camera it may be user error but nonetheless, if you are hoping to use this multiple times, you're going to have to be gentle with it and uh, be wary of the fact that you, you could uh, damage it. Now on that subject, I just looked up the warranty terms that come with this camera. And they are, to be honest, a little bit concerning if you are hoping to use it for more than four rolls of film to make it economic or to use it multiple times to make it environmentally friendly. So the warranty reads as follows. The Ilford Sprite 35-2 is an entry-level plastic camera which is not designed to be repaired. The Ilford Sprite 35-2 is for general use only and not intended for professional or commercial applications. If the product fails to function properly within the first three rolls of film used, we will replace the camera free of charge 
upon its return to your local reseller. Faulty returns must be received back within 30 days of the purchase date. So Ilford are guaranteeing this for the first three rolls of film and 30 days of ownership, which doesn't entirely imply their confidence in its long-term reliability. So that is a little bit of a concern when it comes to those arguments about economy and green credentials, environmental credentials. That's not to say it will go wrong. That's not to say that I've had any problems with mine. It's It's been great in that I've only put one film through it at the moment, uh, and that turned out great. But it's worth noting that that is what Ilford have, have warranted it for, and it's also worth noting that some consumers have reported in reviews that uh, their cameras have failed. So, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some photographs. I went into London a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago in fact, to meet a friend for lunch and at the moment in the UK we are suffering from quite a lot of industrial action, uh, strike union type stuff and that has affected the trains quite badly. Now I checked my train and it was running fine uh, and my friend I was meeting checked his uh, and he thought it was running fine only as I stepped off the train at Thames City Link which is a, a great uh, train station to use if you want to go and visit St Paul's. I got a phone call to say I wasn't going to make it. Now I did, because of the industrial issues, uh, half expect this, and so I brought my Sprite along because my plan B was to do a little bit of a photo walk. Now unlike almost every other Sprite photographer that ever there was, I did take a couple of additional accessories, let's say, with me. The first of which was a light meter. Because if I can only take pictures at 120th of a second at f9, I want to make sure that the day is sunny enough. Now I was using a 400 ISO film, so it was a case of uh, when it came to finding a day to test this, you would put the meter outside your front door and you'd push the button. And uh, no, it's not a sprite day today. And then the next day you would. Stick your meter out the side of the front door and you push the button and no. On this particular day that I was going to London, it was a nice sunny day and the light meter gave me the go ahead. The other accessory, or one of the other accessories I took with me, was a laser rangefinder. Now, you may have noticed on the box it says the minimum focus distance on this camera is one meter. And my best guess, using a depth of field calculator or depth of field table, is that to get sharp or acceptable sharpness from one meter to infinity the plane of focus is probably set to about one and a half meters on a 31 millimeter lens f9 so i wanted to test how sharp it was at its best performance so i took a laser rangefinder with me so that i could take at least one or two pictures at or as near as i could one and a half meters exactly and the last thing i took was a polarizing filter. And I didn't take this to polarize the light or to make the skies darker, I just took it to use as effectively a neutral density filter if the lighting became uh, very bright, let's say. So I went well prepared for my little photo walk uh, around, around St Paul's. So I jumped on the train um, and the first picture I took with this camera was actually as the train was uh, on its way into town and because the train is moving we have a little motion blur here but I think that's actually quite a amusing little picture to start off with and just uh, having arrived or uh, on the way there I wanted to try a photograph just using flash to, to, to illuminate the subject uh, and uh, as we were on the train and the train was in a tunnel I thought this would be an ideal opportunity just to try and photograph the train interior built-in flash and it's tend to be quite harsh um, and this is no exception but I have to say for, for a small little built-in flash unit right next to the lens it's done a surprisingly good job there anyway I arrive at the train station and as I leave the train station I get that phone call saying basically I'm on my own and um, around the City of Thames Link train station it's all modern and built up and not not old London at all and the lighting as it hit these uh, sort of support stanchions uh, was to my eye quite attractive so I um, I took a snap and there it is. Uh, by the time I take an exposure reading to make sure that on the shady side of the building I could use my F9 camera the sun had gone in a little bit so some of the shadows and, and lights of be beams of light had, had passed at that point but I walked out onto the onto the main road 
Um, if you if you leave to City Thames Link via the exit by Starbucks, it's turn right for St Paul's, turn left for Holborn. Just opposite is this church, which had a rather striking clock on it. So I tried to photograph the clock, but of course it's it's a wide angle lens, and so I can't zoom in or anything. But nonetheless, uh, it's a nice enough picture. But we are starting to see here some of the characteristics that make the photographs from this camera distinctive. The uh, church tower, the clock face, perfectly normal, perfectly sharp, just what you'd expect. But just look a little bit to the left and the right where you see uh, the building next door and, and the tree on the right. And we, we're now starting to see quite a lot of softness. Quite uh, an interesting um, effect, if that's the right word. As uh, I walked towards uh, St Paul's, uh, I passed uh, what's called the, the, the Old Bailey, which is a very famous, uh, I believe, highest court in the land. There we go, the Central Criminal Court. So I wanted to try this, this close focus distance. Uh, so I got the, the laser rangefinder out, and sure enough, uh, at one and a half meters, it is actually a pretty sharp lens uh, in the middle, only in the middle. While I was at the Old Bailey, I took a picture of the dome, of course, because, well, you would, wouldn't you? And I think this could be described as distinctive. And again, it shows that the camera has certain characteristics, uh, which would ordinarily, in a, let's say, an expensive camera, be considered undesirable or an expensive lens at any rate but i think with this photograph the extreme lens flare sort of gives us uh, adds character that's what i'm trying to say to the photograph that wouldn't be there if it was a modern you know multi-coated high quality lens and just outside the old bailey is this water feature and again i took this picture to see how how sharp it was at one meter and the answer was actually pretty sharp and not only that but if you look at the public house in the background you can see the name of the viaduct tavern uh, perfectly clearly so we're getting quite a lot of detail in this but again look to the left everything goes soft and if you look to the right in this picture those buildings on the right are actually looking to me to be leaning forward a little bit which is uh, perhaps a little bit unusual so uh, I carried on walking towards um, St Paul's. There's a few uh, name tags and, and plaques, plaques, whichever way you want to pronounce it, on the building. And here again, like the first central court sign, I used a built-in flash in it, and this is a glazed tile. We're getting a little bit of reflection from the tile as well. And so on we go, ever onwards, and we get our first glimpse of St Paul's between these two modern office blocks. And the, the picture of the couple I just caught there is uh, about as near to street photography as I'm ever likely to get. But, you know, if you, if you were wandering around and you took that picture as a tourist, you'd probably be quite happy with it. Now, I didn't go directly to St Paul's. I went to Ave Maria Street first, which is to the west. So let's take a look at some pictures from there. Now, there are, in London, one or two old buildings, sort of pre not just pre-war, but pre-fire of London. Uh, so sometimes you'll see these magnificent old facades from from long, long ago, very old original, well, not original because London's Roman, or maybe even pre-Roman. But you get the idea. This, I believe, is the Worshipful Company of Stationers. It is a, a private uh, building. Um, there's lots of Worshipful Companies, so uh, London's obviously always been a major trading plot point. So every trade had its own trade body, effectively. Uh, and you can still see one or two of these. Now, another business on Ave Maria Street that's pretty well known is, of course, uh, Vidal Sassoon. And this is, these days, of course, we, we generally think of Vidal Sassoon as being a brand of hair care product. But this is actually the uh, salon, very famous place. And the picture of the nameplate the Ave Maria nameplate even though it's a little off center also still quite sharp so as we walk into we walk from Ave Maria Street into Paternoster Square uh, there's this uh, modern sculpture try to take a little picture of that and then we walk into Paternoster Square itself and uh, I tried to photograph this monument in the middle with the pineapple on top plus the modern office buildings and of course uh, Christopher Wren's famous cathedral in the background that monument as i'm calling it is actually a modern construction 
uh, and it disguises uh, an air vent from, I'm not sure if it's the underground or the Elizabeth Line underground train system. They went to a lot of cost and a lot of effort to make it look pretty. I'm not sure they would have done that in other parts of London, but there we go. So what else do we have from Paternoster Square? This is the classic shot between two office buildings or two buildings uh, of the cathedral. And now I'm just going to wander around a little bit in Paternoster Square and around St Paul's. And this uh, is one of my favourite photographs from the roll of film. These benches, I like the way they form uh, kind of a V-shape with the line of the bench and then the line of the flagstones. And I also like the uh, shadows being cast by the railings up above. Uh, I'm getting my photographs a little out of sync here, so uh, I think I'm just going to plough through a few now. This is, uh, I believe, this is a monument to Norman Foster, who's uh, an architect involved in redeveloping this whole area. Now, interestingly, just uh, a short distance from St Paul's Cathedral uh, is this wall. And you might not think that's a terribly interesting wall. It is possible that dates back to 1308, so that uh, might be one of the older parts of London. And it's actually um, a retaining wall or a wall from a, a very famous church, uh, the interior of which is rather beautiful. It was a church which was um, destroyed in the Great Fire of London, and Christopher Wren's office was uh, engaged to rebuild it. It was then damaged in the Blitz during the Second World War, and the interior was completely uh, redesigned as well. But unfortunately, because of the F9 lens on the Sprite 35, those interior photographs you're not going to get with this camera. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind if you have one of these cameras, there are definite limitations. If you're wondering where this church interior is, there's St Paul's. And if you just turn around, there it is. Oh, uh, there's the church that almost nobody goes into, or no tourists go into, with the very nice interior. Going back to St Paul's, we'll just uh, flick through some photographs here. Now mostly I'm aiming the camera upwards because I'm trying to avoid catching uh, people uh, in photographs that might not want to be on YouTube. It's almost inevitable um, in London. It's not so bad on video when you're just panning past, but I uh, don't want to <laughs> publish pictures of people uh, needlessly. Now before I cross the river, uh, I walk down the road a little bit from St Paul's and it's worth going down some of these uh, narrower streets. Uh, away from the, the crowds, or at least away from the crowds on a weekend. And this pub, uh, which I think is at Island Yard, obviously called the Cockpit, as you can see, it was the site of the last legally held cockfight in London. And shockingly, that was as recently as the 1960s. Well, shocking to me at any rate. But if you go inside, it's a great place for a, a swift half. And I still have the original viewing gallery and, and fighting pit. So listed as one of London's top 50 public houses. So that's quite fun. Again, no interior shots because the camera's not up to it. Sorry. So slowly we get to the uh, Millennium Bridge. Uh, and this is one of the only pictures that uh, didn't come out quite right. I do find that the button has to be pressed down quite a long way on the camera. And whilst there's a, a thumb swell here to rest it with, I, di I did slip a couple of times as I was pressing the button. This is the only image that's uh, resulted in camera shake, but uh, worth bearing that in mind. Uh, nonetheless, we uh, move across the Millennium Bridge and we take the photograph that every tourist in London takes. Uh, and it's a great view. A uh, great view across the... Christopher Wren's great work. Just on the other side of the river, of course, we have the Shakespeare Globe Theatre, which I believe is the only thatched building in London now. Great theatre. If you get a chance to see a play there, top tip, get a standing ticket. If you get one of the benches, make sure you get one that's got a backrest and maybe take a cushion. But great, great theatre. Um, well, well recommended. This picture of the Tate Modern uh, or the what was the smokestack or chimney of the Tate Modern is one where I did use the polarizer because it was super super sunny uh, so I just cut the exposure down. Now if you go to the left of the Tate Modern there's a little passageway that leads to the back of the uh, art gallery 
and there's this nice little courtyard area where there's fewer tourists around. There's also quite a few little cafe restaurant type things in a parade of shops opposite. And this is uh, this is getting now close to the uh, end of the roll of the film. The last picture I took was the Tate Modern sign. As I composed this picture in the viewfinder, only the words Tate Modern filled the entire viewfinder. So you can see there is quite a quite a margin of error. Anyway, I've prattled on about these photographs uh, quite long enough. Thank you for your patience, I do appreciate it. Should you buy a Sprite 35 Mark II? Well, as is often the case, the answer is maybe. I couldn't recommend it as one's only or first or main camera. The, the limited exposure settings uh, and the interesting uh, lens produces unique results, but you don't always want those sort of ultra-wide peculiar pictures every time. And coupled with that question mark over the reliability, I don't think it's the first camera you should own. Now, if you already have another camera that you're using all the time, even if it's just the camera on your mobile phone, as a second camera, as a, a novelty effectively, then yes, absolutely, it's, uh, I think it's well worth the £40. Uh, and I think the pictures it produces under the right conditions are very interesting. So make of that what you will. Now if I were to compare it to second-hand cameras, then obviously you can get a lot for your money. Now it's not entirely fair to compare a new camera with a used camera, but as the warranty on this is relatively limited, uh, I think it's worth bearing that in mind. If you want the dramatic effect this camera produces with its very wide lens, terrific. If you're looking to start in film photography and take, as it were, good or regular or normal photos, maybe uh, an older vintage camera, perhaps from the 80s or 90s, might be a better way to spend your £40. And also, very environmentally friendly, because we didn't have to make anything out of virginal new plastic. Anyway. Thank you for watching, I do appreciate it, do have a good day.